They say politics makes strange bedfellows, and for Bill and Hillary Clinton, that could not be more true. The Clintons are nothing if not the ultimate survivors. Nearly two decades after they burst onto the national stage, they are still dominating it. With Hillary mounting an extraordinary comeback, to the extent that she now polls as America's most admired political figure, while Bill virtually runs a parallel United Nations from his Manhattan offices. Bill and Hillary had been using the first person plural since his initial run for governor in 1978, when Bill told the New York Times, our vote was a vindication of what my wife and I have done and what we hope to do for the state. They were such a working unit in Arkansas that they became known as Billary, a term of disparagement as well as admiration. The areas in which they deferred to each other, their private roles, their spheres of political expertise, the way they presented themselves to the public, all these were set during Bill's long years as governor. So too were the habits and rhythms of their marriage, her tolerance of his philandering and his delegation of responsibilities to her. As in any marriage, each partner had domains of primacy. These arrangements travelled with them during the long campaign of 1992 and into 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Bill Clinton's run for the presidency was a triumph of political skill, luck, intelligence, deception, resilience and sheer endurance. It was a flawed victory in some crucial respects. His behaviour had created doubts about his character and he antagonised many potential allies. National political reporters were dazzled by Bill and Hillary's talent, but also disillusioned by their inability to be forthright about themselves and their plans for the presidency. The Clintons were deeply shaken by the scrutiny of the press, an experience that coloured their view of Washington and those responsible for telling their story. Bill doubtless would have lost the election without Hillary's unyielding support when his character was under attack. Her rescue of his candidacy had enormous public consequences as it made him beholden to her in ways that pervasively influenced his administration's policies. The Clintons are closely aligned in many aspects of policy and are unquestionably highly ambitious and determined individuals. The parallels in the careers of this husband and wife team are really quite astounding, as we discover looking back at their political journey. Bill Clinton was born on August 19, 1946, in Hope, Arkansas, as William Jefferson Blythe III. His father died in an auto accident before he was born, and when his mother remarried, Bill took on the last name of his stepfather. After high school, Clinton studied at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Winning a Rhodes Scholarship in his senior year, he went on to Oxford University in England for two years. In 1970, he returned to the United States and won a scholarship to Yale Law School, where he supported himself with odd jobs and met Hillary Rodham. Clinton served briefly as a law professor on the faculty of the University of Arkansas. As a young man, Clinton had gained experience working on several political campaigns, including that of George McGovern. And in 1974, he made his first bid for office, running for a congressional seat in the US House of Representatives. Clinton lost, but the race was so close that it helped him get the necessary acclaim to win the 1976 Attorney General's race. In this position, he fought rate increases by public utilities, stood against the construction of a coal-burning power plant, and in general promoted tougher laws to protect the environment and the rights of consumers. In 1978, he ran a successful bid for Governor of Arkansas, and at 32 was the youngest governor in Arkansas's history. During this first term, 
Clinton alienated several important factions of Arkansas society. In attempt to upgrade Arkansas's roads, which ranked amongst the worst in the country, Clinton levied taxes on car owners. His opposition to the clear cutting of trees lost him the support of the lumber and paper industries. He alienated the banking industry by penalising those institutions that did not lend money to smaller businesses that would create jobs in their communities. In 1980, he was defeated for governor by a former Democrat who had switched parties just so he could run against Clinton. In the following election, Clinton ran again, and this time was victorious. He was elected three more times. During his tenure as governor of Arkansas, one of Clinton's priorities was education. The dropout rate fell and the number of young people from Arkansas who entered college began to rise. The small towns and rural areas of the South are still the poorest parts of the country. It's still the part of the country that has the lowest level of education, highest infant mortality rates, except for the big cities. And a lot of problems that, uh, that need to be addressed in terms of targeted efforts to diversify the economy and to upgrade the education system. So I, I still think that the South is a distinctive region that, that's going to need some attention in the next uh, administration. It's my greatest privilege to introduce to you the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Described as the first major U.S. female political figure since Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Rodham Clinton has become a strong force in American politics. In 1999, Hillary Clinton formed an exploratory committee to pursue the possibility of running for the U.S. Senate seat to be vacated by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the New York Democrat. She's a great campaigner, and I think she would make an excellent senator. On February the 6th, 2000, Hillary Clinton officially announced her bid to become the next senator for New York. Even before Mrs. Clinton officially declared her candidacy, the contest was being billed as the race of the century. New York voters and political pundits alike had been anticipating a race between the First Lady and the outspoken mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. I think she has some new ideas, and I think that it would be refreshing to have somebody with some new ideas in the Senate in New York. If it's Rudy Giuliani and Hillary, it's going to be the most fun campaign. Um, I think she has no idea what New York is about, and it's fine if she wants to run. Robert Kennedy ran and wasn't a resident, and she actually resident. She doesn't even have to live in New York until she gets elected by the rules. Um, I think she's going to get eaten alive. She hates the media. I think it's a big mistake and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch, but they're going to chew her up and spit her out. The traditional narrative of the 2000 Senate race, the first time Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani faced each other in an election, is that Giuliani was forced to drop out of the race in May because of the sudden emergence of personal issues. But in reality, Giuliani was already losing. Hillary Clinton's relentless ground game had slowly eaten away at his lead, but Rudy had done the bulk of the damage himself. In early 2000, polls showed Rudy beating Hillary. Then Hillary began her long march through the snow, and Rudy reminded New York voters again and again what an abrasive figure he could be. The more he made Clinton appear to be a victim and himself a bully, the better Clinton fared. It was not until May, when Giuliani's Senate hopes were sidelined, that Lazio, a congressman little known outside his Long Island district, was thrust into the limelight. Lazio unsurprisingly began to campaign exactly as Giuliani had, back when he was seen as the inevitable victor. Once again, the GOP Senate candidate made Hillary the issue. Twice in one race, a Republican candidate's attacks on Hillary had provided no net benefit. In 2000, Hillary Rodham Clinton became the first president's wife to win elected office. 
defeating Republican Representative Rick Lazio in the most expensive, highest profile Senate race in American history. After the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 on the World Trade Center in downtown New York City, Senator Clinton worked to secure $21.4 billion in funding to assist cleanup and recovery to provide health tracking for the first responders and volunteers at Ground Zero and to create grants for redevelopment. This is a call to action. I've spoken with the White House at length, encouraging them to put into the president's budget money to continue the treatment program that has now started. Without the president's budget commitment, the program that is treating many of these victims will end. I believe this is a moral responsibility of our nation. We owe it to these responders, the residents and others who were sickened because of the attack on our country. I'm very pleased with how Hillary Clinton has taken care of New York politics and taken care of the people that are involved here in New York City. And she really cares about the people at the site, especially all of the health problems that have come about. And I think she'd very much like to take care of that. Um, and she'd be a good candidate for a presidential election coming up. In October 1991, five-term Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton declared he was running for President of the United States. For the team starting to build around him, it was political love at first sight. Clinton appeared to be the centrist, charismatic candidate for whom they'd been waiting. He prepared for a run in 1992 amidst a crowded field, seeking to beat the incumbent President George H.W. Bush. In the 12 years of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, no state rose so high nor fell so far. It was a story of credit and debt, of expansion and overextension, followed by bankruptcy. People had lost their jobs and increasingly their homes. Into this walks the man who would be president, Bill Clinton, the front runner for the Democratic nomination and his wife Hillary, representing hope, change and vision. Well, the truth is, this country is in trouble. We're in a recession that came to New Hampshire, signed, sealed, and delivered by the policies of the Bush administration. Governor of Arkansas Bill Clinton was selected as the nominee through a series of primary elections and caucuses, culminating in the 1992 Democratic National Convention held from July 13 to July 16 in New York City. People are beginning to believe in the possibility of change again. During the 92 Democratic Convention, the convention hall was plagued by the fact that independent candidate Ross Perot was tied with or beating Clinton in opinion research polls. This caused a moderate turn of events at the convention to win back Perot voters from the Perot campaign. This led to the selection of such speakers such as Representative Barbara Jordan from Texas to deliver a bipartisan keynote address to the convention delegates. Also speaking was the vice presidential nominee, Al Gore, who appealed to the center as he was, at the time, a southern moderate Democrat from Tennessee. However, on the last day the convention convened, Ross Perot dropped out of the presidential race and left a gap for both Bush and Clinton to scramble for newly undecided voters. Now that we have changed the world, it's time to change America. I call this approach a new covenant, a solemn agreement between the people and their government, based not simply on what each of us can take, but what all of us must give to our nation. Perhaps the thing that bothers me most is how he derides and degrades the American tradition 
of seeing and seeking a better future. He mocks it as the vision thing. But just remember what the scripture says. Where there is no vision, the people Clinton Harris. chose Tennessee Senator and former 1988 presidential candidate Al Gore to be his running mate. Choosing Gore, who was from Clinton's neighboring state of Tennessee, went against the popular strategy of balancing a southern candidate with a northern partner. Gore did serve to balance the ticket in other ways, as he was perceived as strong on family values and environmental issues. Clinton and Gore began a bus tour around the United States shortly thereafter, while the Bush quail campaign began to criticize Clinton's character, highlighting accusations of infidelity and draft dodging. We have no way of confirming that. The uncle is dead. We never, Bill never heard of that before. And the source is a Republican. It's absurd that the story got as far as it did. There's no credible basis for the story. The Bush campaign emphasized its foreign policy successes such as Desert Storm and the end of the Cold War. Bush also contrasted his military service to Clinton's lack thereof and criticized Clinton's lack of foreign policy expertise. However, as the economy was the main issue, Bush's campaign floundered across the nation, even in strongly Republican areas, and Clinton maintained leads with over 50% of the vote nationwide consistently. The campaign continued with a lopsided lead for Clinton through September, until Ross Perot decided to re-enter the race. that he offers hope and promise for the future. This is the first time since 1968 that I've been involved in a presidential candidacy. I think he'll make a great president. I think he's uh, fully qualified. I like what he did with the state of Arkansas. And I think, he'll, I think he can lead our country back to prosperity. I think Clinton has shown us what very few candidates have, and that is that he understands what human brokenness is about, and he showed honesty and uh, perseverance in the face of that. And I think that's a, a wonderful invitation to us all. Initially, Perot's return saw the Texas billionaire's numbers stay low until he was given the opportunity to participate in a trio of unprecedented three-man debates. The race narrowed as Perot's numbers significantly improved as Clinton's numbers declined, while Bush's numbers remained more or less the same from earlier in the race as Perot and Bush began to hammer at Clinton on character issues once again. They have had the White House so long that they've run out of energy, run out of ideas, run out of direction, and they ought to be run out of town. And with your help, we can. This is not a matter of party. It's a matter of people and the country and the future of America. We've got to change this country. A government that's fair to everybody, not just the privileged few. A government that brings us together instead of dividing us. A government that faces our problems and tells the people the truth instead of denying them until election time and then trying to throw money at them at the last minute. I tell you, we can do better than that. Throughout election night, Clinton overperformed in rural areas of the country. Clinton also won rural voters in the South and Midwest carrying states such as Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana, Georgia, and Iowa. Clinton's charisma combined with an impressive campaign staff resulted in victory. Clinton defeated incumbent Republican President George Bush amid a slumping U.S. economy and became the first president born after World War II. My fellow Americans, on this day, with high hopes and brave hearts in massive numbers, the American people have voted to make a new beginning. On the 20th of January, 2007, Two years to the day before the next presidential inauguration, Senator Clinton filed with the Federal Elections Commission to declare her formation of an exploratory presidential campaign committee. 
Nine months later, she formally declared her candidacy for the US presidency. This was unprecedented. Clinton proved to be the first woman in history who occupied a position of elective national office as a member of a national party to enter and remain in a presidential primary race to the end of the season. And the unusual precedent vied only with her own record in having run for and been elected to the US Senate since no other woman who would be or had been first lady had stood for public office. It was a, um, a thorough uh, review for me about uh, the problems that we confront in the country, the particular strengths and talents that I would bring both to the race and to the White House. Uh, and I concluded uh, that uh, based on the work of my lifetime and my experience and my understanding of what our country has to confront in order to continue to make opportunity available to all of our citizens here and to restore our leadership and respect for America around the world, uh, that I would be able uh, to do that, to bring our country together to meet those tough challenges. And therefore, I decided uh, that I would uh, contest for the primary. And I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a, a great contest with a lot of talented people. Uh, and I am very confident. I'm in. I'm in to win. And that's what I intend to do. Throughout the end of 2007 and into early 2008, Senator Clinton joined in several debates with all the other Democratic presidential candidates. In 2008, she began the primary season, campaigning across the country and continuing her fundraising, which would total over 100 million. Despite her many political achievements as First Lady, it proved difficult to emphasize them since she had done so in a position that was neither official nor elective. Among the states she won in the primaries were New Hampshire, California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina and Indiana. Although she had been predicted through 2007 as the favoured candidate and likely nominee of her party, she found her Senate colleague, Barack Obama, who represented her own native state of Illinois, to be a formidable challenger. We can do better than that. That's not a Democratic agenda or a Republican agenda. That's an American agenda. By early December 2007, the race between her and Obama had tightened up, especially in the early caucus and primary states of Iowa, New Hampshire and South Carolina. With real voting less than a month away, Obama was now ahead in some Iowa polls and had brought in ultra-popular television host Oprah Winfrey to conduct joint campaign rallies in three states before large crowds. South Carolina, I do believe he's the one to bring us the audacity of hope, Barack Obama. Partly in counter of the latter, Clinton brought into Iowa her daughter Chelsea and a very rare campaign appearance from her 88-year-old mother, Dorothy Rodham. Now everyone running for your support is talking about change. Some people think you bring about change by demanding it, and some people think you bring about change by hoping for it. I think you make change by working really, really hard for it every single day. I'm not asking you to take me on faith. I'm not asking you to take a leap of faith. I'm asking you to look at the evidence, to look at the record. Well, you know, I am not running for president to put Band-Aids on our problems. I am running for president to try to solve them. We are problem-solving people. We know how to do this. We're not acting like it anymore. I will work my heart out every day to make the changes that America deserves to have. And I will be ready on day one to assume the responsibilities that we, starting tomorrow, will pass on to the next president. So please, put on your coats, warm up the car, call your friends, pick up a buddy, 
come out to caucus tomorrow night, and together we will make history. Thank you all so much, and God bless you. Veteran political observers reported that things are tense in Hillary land these days, that the camps of Clinton and her husband were at odds, and that the campaign's plan A of being the dominating inevitable establishment candidate was at risk of failing. And one thing you know about me is that after 16 years of taking all their incoming fire, I am still here, much to their dismay. In times of crisis, people tend to look to more charismatic leaders, people with more fire, with more emotional intensity. What you see is a Hillary Clinton, who's a pretty good politician, but a Barack Obama, who's become a rock star. Although Clinton was the 25th woman to run for US president, she was the first female candidate to have held a highly probable chance of winning the nomination of a major party and the presidential election. Maggie Thatcher, Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, a lot of other countries have had women, so we're a little lagging behind here, I, I would say. Following Clinton's choked up moment in New Hampshire and surprise victory there the following day, discussion of gender roles in the campaign moved front and center. Women following the campaign recalled a series of criticisms of Clinton, such as the pitch of her voice, a debate moderator's question of whether she was likable, and Obama's reply that she was likable enough, felt by some to be condescending, and hecklers' demands that she iron their shirt as motivations for re-examining who they would support in the contest. Hello, Iowa! Oh, thank you all so much! In the initial delegate selection event of 2008, she placed third with 29.45% of the state delegate selections in the January 3rd, 2008 Iowa Democratic Caucus to Obama's 37.58% and Edwards's 29.75%. In terms of the actual number of delegates that would later be selected to the national convention, the difference between the top three candidates was minor, with Clinton possibly ahead of Edwards. Nevertheless, in terms of damaging her image as the inevitable leader in the race and in giving Obama considerable momentum, this was a major blow to Clinton's campaign. In the wake of the Iowa defeat, the campaign hoped that Bill Clinton would help salvage a win in New Hampshire, where he had achieved a political comeback in his 1992 presidential campaign. In 1993 saw the start of America's first Democratic presidency in a dozen years. In his first address to the nation on February the 15th, 1993, Clinton announced his intention to raise taxes to cap the budget deficit. This week, Congress will cast a few crucial vote on my plan for economic recovery. In a comprehensive economic plan, there are always places for give and take. But from the first day to this day, I have stood firm on certain ideas and ideals that are at the heart of this plan. Tonight, I can report to you that every one of those principles is contained in the final version of the plan. First, the largest deficit reduction in history, nearly $500 billion with more spending cuts than tax increases. Rather than the games and gimmicks of the past, this plan has 200 specific spending cuts and it reduces government spending by more than $250 billion. We cut more than 100,000 positions from the federal payroll by attrition. We freeze discretionary spending for five years. We limit pay increases for federal employees. On February 17, in a nationally televised address to a joint session of Congress, President Clinton Speaker, unveiled his economic plan. Members of the House and the Senate, distinguished Americans here as visitors in this chamber, as am I. It is nice to have a fresh excuse for giving a long speech. 
When presidents speak to Congress and the nation from this podium, typically they comment on the full range and challenges and opportunities that face the United States. But this is not an ordinary time, and for all the many tasks that require our attention, I believe tonight one calls on us to focus, to unite, and to act, and that is our economy. For more than anything else, our task tonight as Americans is to make our economy thrive again. Let me begin by saying that it has been too long, at least three decades since a president has come and challenged Americans to join him on a great national journey, not merely to consume the bounty of today, but to invest for a much greater one tomorrow. The plan focused on deficit reduction rather than a middle-class tax cut, which had been high on his campaign agenda. In 1993, Clinton made a speech to Congress regarding a health care reform plan aimed at achieving universal coverage through a national health care plan. This was one of the most prominent items on Clinton's legislative agenda and resulted from a task force headed by Hillary Clinton. Today I am announcing the formation of the President's Task Force on National Health Reform. Although the issue is complex, the task force's mission is simple build on the work of the campaign and the transition, listen to all parties, and prepare health care reform legislation to be submitted to Congress within 100 days of our taking office. This task force will be chaired by the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton. I think that in the coming months, the American people will learn, as the people of our state did, that we have a First Lady of many talents, but who most of all can bring people together Though at first well received in political circles, it was eventually doomed from conservatives, the American Medical Association and the health insurance industry. However, John F. Harris, a biographer of Clinton's, states that the program failed because of a lack of coordination within the White House. Controversial events within Clinton's administration, as well as his own personal conduct, would eventually provide opportunities for his opponents to damage him politically and First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton as well. Personal tragedy for the Clintons occurred as Vince Foster, Deputy White House Counsel and lifelong friend of the President, was found shot dead in a park just outside Washington from an apparent suicide. Huge controversy erupted five months later when it was revealed that federal investigators had been denied access to Foster's White House office, but that Clinton aides had entered the office within hours of Foster's death. Speculation arose in the media that documents related to the Whitewater Development Corporation might have been removed. A month before his death, Foster had filed three years of delinquent Whitewater corporate tax returns the Whitewater controversy would eventually spark a federal investigation of President Clinton and the First Lady. It was a good investment offered by somebody who knew a lot, who could provide a lot of good uh, advice, and I was lucky and made the decision to stop when I did. Clinton was likewise deeply involved in the Middle East peace process to negotiate peace agreements between Israel and the Palestinians as well as with the Arab governments of Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. Clinton personally arranged for the peace accord to be signed at the White House on September 13, 1993. The agreement allowed a limited Palestinian self-rule in the Israeli-occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Mr. President, thank you, thank you, thank you. In July 1994, Clinton helped coordinate a historic compromise between longtime enemies Israel and Jordan to end their state of war. With this agreement between Jordan's King Hussein and Israel's Rabin, Jordan became only the second Arab state after Egypt to normalize relations with Israel. In the 1996 presidential election, Clinton was re-elected, receiving 49.2% of the popular vote over Republican Bob Dole and reform candidate Ross Perot. 
becoming the first Democratic incumbent since Lyndon Johnson to be elected to a second term and the first Democrat since Franklin Roosevelt to be elected president more than once. The Republicans lost a few seats in the House and gained a few in the Senate, but retained control of both houses of the 105th United States Congress. In 1997, Clinton finally had a chance to sign a major health care bill into law. Throughout 1998, there was controversy over Clinton's relationship with a young White House intern, Monica Lewinsky. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. However, after it was revealed that investigators had obtained a semen-stained dress, as well as testimony from Lewinsky, Clinton changed tactics and admitted that an improper relationship with Lewinsky had taken place. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure on my part for which I am solely and completely responsible. Faced with overwhelming evidence, he apologised to the nation, agreed to pay a court fine, settled his sexual harassment lawsuit with Paula Jones and was temporarily disbarred for a period of five years from practising law. He was not tried for perjury in a court. However, he did admit to testifying falsely in a carefully worded statement as part of a deal to avoid indictment for perjury. I don't think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. It is important to me that everybody who has been hurt know that the sorrow I feel is genuine. First and most important, my family, also my friends, my staff, my cabinet, Monica Lewinsky and her family. In a period of increasingly divided politics, Clinton moved his policies more to the centre to appeal to mainstream America. Despite being impeached, he remained a very popular president. I'm very grateful to be able to turn over the reins of leadership to a new president, with America in such a strong position to meet the challenges of the future. As Hillary Clinton had assumed more and more of the spotlight due to her run for the presidency and her subsequent appointment to Secretary of State, she has had to confront allegations and assumptions that somehow Bill Clinton, her husband and former President of the United States, is still in the driving seat, asserting power behind the scenes. On the day before the primary, press reports indicated that Hillary Clinton advisers were pessimistic about the immediate future thinking it was unlikely she would be able to win either New Hampshire or South Carolina. We know what we need is someone ready on day one. I know we're ready. Thank you all and God bless you. Issues of race came to the forefront as campaigning began for the January 26 South Carolina primary, the first to feature large African-American participation in the Democratic electorate. First in the closing stages of the New Hampshire campaign, Bill Clinton had referred to Obama's claim that he has been a staunch opponent of the Iraq war from the beginning as a fairy tale, which some subsequently thought was a characterization of Obama's entire campaign. After South Carolina, the Clinton campaign sought to find a gentler role for Bill Clinton, whose actions during the South Carolina campaign were suspected of having polarised the Democratic electorate and harming Hillary Clinton's standing among women, in addition to having contributed to Ted Kennedy's decision to endorse Obama. It's time again for a new generation of leadership. It is time now for Barack Obama. On the 3rd of June 2008, Senator Obama won the necessary number of delegate pledges. Hillary Clinton suspended her campaign several days later and delivered a stirring concession speech in Washington, D.C. to her supporters, 
emphasising that she was not interested in having a cult personality following, but in her party achieving dramatic change in the executive branch. Everyone who has stumbled but stood right back up, this one is for you. She addressed the National Democratic Convention and endorsed the candidacy of Obama. The way to continue our fight now to accomplish the goals for which we stand is to take our energy, our passion, our strength, and do all we can to help elect Barack Obama, the next president of the United States. I endorse him and throw my full support behind him. Throughout the fall, she campaigned vigorously on his behalf, and after he won the 2008 election, he named her as his Secretary of State. In January of 2009, Hillary Clinton became the 67th Secretary of State the third woman and the only former First Lady to serve in this capacity. Halfway through the first term of the Obama administration, Secretary Clinton had travelled over half a million miles to 77 countries. She has employed not only the diplomatic tactics traditionally used by those in her position, but political skills also learned through her White House and Senate years. The challenge is to create a global framework that recognizes the different needs and responsibilities of developed and developing countries alike. As Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton has focused special attention beyond her required duties to focus on the international rights of women and economic empowerment in financially depressed regions of the world. Equal access to education, employment, healthcare, and legal recourse for women in all countries has been an unwavering aspect of her career, from First Lady to Senator to Secretary of State. When Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, she pledged a smart power policy that meant striking up a close working relationship with Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, while reshaping the State Department to emphasize development and people-powered diplomacy. She deployed her personal star power in direct contacts with the public overseas, speaking clearly about human rights and freedom of expression on the internet. She's been tough too. When China was over-assertive about the South China Sea, she rallied other nations. When Libya's Gaddafi threatened to massacre civilians in Benghazi, she was key in building support in the UN for the multilateral military action that is helping to protect those civilians. She has strengthened American alliances in Europe and Asia while also engaging the emerging powers of China, India and Brazil. The United States has thrived as an open society, a principled nation and a global leader. And we cannot and will not live in fear sacrifice our values or pull back from the world. Closing our borders, for example, might keep out some who would do us harm, but it would also deprive us of entrepreneurs, ideas, and energy, things that help define who we are as a nation and ensure our global leadership for years to come. But above all, Hillary has set a model of how to be a member of a team of rivals. Unlike in many administrations that have suffered from friction between state defense and the White House, Barack Obama's strongest rival in 2008 has become one of the most effective and loyal supporters in an administration that has been notably cohesive on foreign policy. Both Clintons offer something unusual in world politics, their trademark optimism. At the Clinton Global Initiative, Bill described as a no-brainer a plan to create one million new jobs by retrofitting buildings to make them more energy efficient. While the Clintons lead separate professional lives, they deal with some of the same leaders and issues. The William J. Clinton Foundation works in more than 40 countries on health, climate change 
and economic development, often collaborating with governments. There are those who believe that outside of all political manoeuvring, the Clintons' partnership will do far more good than harm in the world. If Bill Clinton has influenced his wife's foreign policy interests, she has almost certainly guided his. Opinion aside, Bill and Hillary Clinton are a powerful partnership. The parallel politics of this influential twosome will go down in the history books and most certainly be dissected and examined by future generations to come. Thank you.